14 sheets of plywood, 20 hinges, 682 screws. This is going to be one of the biggest builds that I've ever done. And by I, I mean we. And by we, I mean me, Chris, and Sean. In total, it took us about six and a half days to complete, one of which started at 9.30 in the morning and ended at 4.30 the following morning. And I'll admit, I had some fun along the way, but this definitely wasn't something that I would describe as a fun build. In the end, though, it was one of the rare times that I actually felt impressed by seeing something that I was part of. So let's jump into it and we'll walk you through the whole process. Oh, and I made up that 682 screws part. I didn't really count. All right, so we're starting the project, and I guess the first question is, what should we do first? We got a lot of plywood here. Tell me if this is a dumb idea. Basically just cut- It's a dumb idea. What I was gonna say. Cut out every single piece slightly oversized. We're done dealing with big sheets. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about lugging anything heavy around. Yep, I, that is exactly what I would do. We'll rough cut everything from there. We can refine on the table saw or- Yeah, we may be even able to do table saw since there's two of us. Yeah. And that's exactly what we ended up doing. Using the table saw for the lion's share of the cuts and the Craig Adaptive Cutting System for some of the cross-cutting that was too wide for the table saw. All that said, at this point, we're breaking things down in a really rough manner, basically leaving them as large as the sheets will allow. And in terms of accuracy at this point, the only real concern is making sure that the blade is at a perfect 90 degrees and making sure to keep track of the pieces so that we're organized. So for example, see how I'm writing purple on this post-it? That's because I have everything color-coded in this really gaudy-looking SketchUp file that I made where I organized all of our pieces. And actually, let's quickly go over the entire build so that you'll have a frame of reference moving forward. Here's the room that we're building this piece for. As you can see, it has a skinny entry point, and that's because this used to be a closet. Well, technically, it's still a closet. It just isn't one for this room. All right, let's lose some of the walls to get a better view. So the build itself is essentially composed of a large angled cabinet, a really large corner cabinet to make up for the lack of a closet, and three smaller, shallower cabinets. On top of the three smaller cabinets, we'll have two shelf units, one of which was designed to accommodate a TV. And behind all the doors, there's going to be adjustable shelving. And I guess that's really about it. Though, it feels like I'm forgetting something. So we just got the pieces roughed out. What are you thinking? The next step is to get everything to its final dimension. The only thing is we need to go through and see what things we can't cut to final dimension yet, things that need to be like referenced. So all of the shelves, so anything, basically anything that's in between a span, yep. doors. doors. Yep. Um, with the, t like how- Okay, now the reason that I left some of the confusion in there is because a build like this is all about that in terms of growth or getting better as a woodworker. There's nothing about this build that is technically challenging. We're basically just cutting things square aside from a few angles. So more than any kind of muscle memory skill or anything else, it's really just your ability to think of things in advance. And the fact that we, or at least I, sound slightly confused while thinking my way through the build, I think that shows the growth. Earlier on in my woodworking career, I might have just looked at my drawings and said, this piece needs to be 62 inches and cut it to 62 inches. But knowing the order to cut things in, what things need to wait and so forth, actually makes it a lot faster and, more importantly, more accurate. Here's a good example that expands on that idea. Looking at our cut list, while talking, we broke the pieces up into cut now and cut later. And that's great. Now, your instincts might be to work your way through all of the cut now pieces and finish them off. But really, you should be thinking, these pieces need to be 15 and a quarter inches wide, but so do these pieces. So I should rip all of them to finish with that one time. And look, all these pieces need to be 13 inches. Ooh, all these need to be 37 and a half inches long. Basically, paying attention to order of operations. Because even a mediocre fence that hasn't been adjusted is better than the most accurate tape measure when there's a human using it. In any case, at this point we've cut everything that we can to the finished dimension, and now we can cut the stretcher pieces before we assemble. Sean? So once we had all of our main panels cut to size, we then needed to cut the upper stretchers. Building the cabinets this way was quick and efficient, since we weren't cutting any dados or rabbits. It also gave us a clean aesthetic as there wouldn't be any visible pocket holes on the insides of the cabinets. We cut these to about four inches wide, which is completely arbitrary. And as you can see here, Chris keeps his blade so sharp, it often feels like we aren't cutting anything at all. Or maybe we just miscalculate our material width. I'll let you decide. At this point, we had all the parts needed to start assembling all of the cabinet boxes. But before we did that, 
we first did some quick sanding on any of the faces that would be showing after final assembly. We first started by cleaning out the dried glue from one of Chris's glue bottles. I keep reminding Chris to close the glue bottles, but it just doesn't seem to stick. After that, we actually started by first putting together the cabinet with the angled end. We used a combination of glue and screws for all of the joints, and we drove screws in from underneath the cabinet for the bottom joints. Then with our outside panels attached, we could measure to the center in order to find where our middle divider would sit. And with that in place, we could cut our top stretchers to length and attach those with pocket holes. Chris is showing here how important the proper pre-pocket hole procedure is. Yep, another perfect pocket hole pre-drill performance. From there, we could attach the top panel, which exactly matched the bottom panel, with a few screws up through the stretchers. With the first cabinet assembled, we could put the three smaller boxes together. These were constructed very similar to the first, though for these we were able to use pocket holes on our side panels instead of driving screws up through the bottom, since these three boxes would ultimately be attached together and the pocket holes would never be seen. The only one we didn't do this for was the outside end, which would be seen after the final install. So for this, we screwed the side panel in place from below, like we had done on the first cabinet. With all of the lower cabinets assembled, we could build the upper shelving units that would sit on top of the right side cabinets. As with most of this project, it was just a matter of cutting the panels to width and length, then assembling them with glue and screws. So with all of our lower cabinets and the upper shelving units assembled, we could start working on the tall corner cabinet that would essentially be used as a closet. The first thing we did was build the upper and lower panels, which needed to be an L shape. We decided to make these out of two pieces for each panel, as it would be easier to get a clean and accurate inside 90 degree angle than if we had tried to cut it out as one piece. And we achieved this by breaking each one into a square and a rectangle and using dominoes to glue them together into one panel. With the top and bottom panels finished and the side panels cut to size, we assembled the corner cabinet in the same way as the others with glue and screws. With those in place, we then added back panels to enclose the entire closet and to add some structural rigidity, as well as added a back panel to the angled cabinet, as we needed the back to extend from the cabinets to the angled shelves. The only tricky part here was adding a bevel on one end to match the angle already on the end of the cabinet.
<laughs> All right, so, so far we've pretty much been tag team and everything, got the boxes assembled. Mm -hmm. Now we can finally split up. So we have to do the doors and the bases that the boxes will sit on next. So why don't we split up? You do the doors, I'll do the bases. And uh, why don't you make your head really little? I'm gonna make my head <laughs> big, ready, go. Okay, so I started off by ripping a bunch of material to four inches wide, since that's how tall the bases needed to be. And you know what? On second thought, let's do the doors first and then come back to this. Are you sure? Yeah, I think it'd just make more sense that we finish off the cabinets before we put them on the bases, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So I started off by cutting Actually, the you know what though? You just got finished talking about a big section, so maybe I should talk now. Just switch things up. Yeah, man. Whatever you think works. I'm, I'm good with whatever. Now, you know what? Actually, yeah, you go. Okay. Do the doors. So I started off by cutting all the lower cabinet doors to dimension. The six doors on the right side were all identical, while the two on the left side were the same size. But the door on the left needed a bevel to match I changed the my mind. I'm going to do the bases. So, like I was saying, I ripped everything to four inches wide, and after that was done, I used the ACS to cross-cut the factory edge off of each of the long strips. Next, I could start cutting everything to the finished length, still over at the ACS, and again, I think an animation is going to be better at explaining what I'm doing rather than just seeing me do a bunch of cross-cuts. So here's what I'm making. Two shallow platforms that'll go under the shallower cabinets, and then one shorter, wider platform, one longer, wider platform, and one triangle end cap platform thing. The goal is to end up with a shape that leaves three inches of overhang along every edge of the cabinets, except for along the back where there's going to be one inch of overhang. And that should leave enough space that the cabinets will clear the baseboard and they can butt up against the walls. Actually, cutting things was pretty straightforward, and for the most part, just a matter of marking things out, setting a stop fence, and then repeating. And I'm sure some of you will wonder why I don't use a miter saw to do this, and that is certainly a way that you could go, but in order to take advantage of it, you really have to have a big miter saw station. And to have a big miter saw station, well, it takes up a lot of space. And I just can't justify the space compared to the amount that I think that I'd use something like that, at least not at this point, but maybe down the road, who knows. Anyhow, the only not straightforward part here was making the triangle piece. And to do that, I cut what would be the front face by making a 45 degree cut, measuring out the finished length, and making another 45 degree cut on the opposite end. Then I could put a 45 degree cut on the end of two other pieces and kind of dry assemble and mark where I'd need to make a 90 degree cut to finish off the lengths of these pieces. And here's a little detail shot that might illustrate it a bit more clearly. And again, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I still can't think of what it is. <sighs> Anyhow, then I could assemble everything in fast motion, just like I always do. Hey Chris, is it cool if I go now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. At this point, all of our cabinets were constructed and we could move on to some of the details, which included the doors. So I started off by cutting all of the lower cabinet doors to dimension. The six doors on the right side were all identical, while the two on the left side were the same size, but the door on the left needed a bevel to match the angle on the cabinet. What's up? Dude, I remembered what I was forgetting. I forgot to edit my About Me page on my website. What do you mean? Your favorite show was Dharma and Greg and your favorite shoes were Crocs? I was going through a phase, don't worry about it, but I gotta get rid of it, I don't know what to do. Well, do you use Squarespace? I do, but I don't know how to code. Well, the good thing is you don't need to code. Here's what you do. Log in, go to the page you wanna edit, and type in the new text. Ah, wow, that was really easy. Well, yeah, and uh, the best thing is you didn't even need to call me. They have 24-7 tech support, and uh, they have 
built-in mobile website, so any page you make, it looks great on any device. Can you purchase domains? Yeah. Do they have commerce tools with inventory management, simple checkout process, and secure payments? Yeah. Well, how many products can I have? Unlimited. Well, do you have a discount code I could use? Well, you already have a website, but if you wanted to make a new one, you could use our discount code. Just go to squarespace.com slash four eyes for a free trial. Then when you're ready to launch, use the offer code four eyes for 10% off. All the details are in the description. Description? Thanks, Squarespace. Let's get back to the build. With the doors cut to size, I could start mounting the hardware, and I usually use a drill press to drill the hinge mortises, but Chris had a handy Craig jig that worked surprisingly well. From there, I could attach the other half of the hinges to the inside of the cabinets, which can be a little tedious, but once again, Chris had a jig for that. This one was from Rockler, and it made quick work of pre-drilling holes for the screws in the right spots. With the doors installed and mostly fine-tuned, we could start cutting in the door pools. And the reason we had to wait is because the pools visually extend from one door to another. So let's talk about the design. When Sean and I were coming up with the design, we were really worried about the whole thing coming across as a big group of boxes. And we tried to break things up with staggered depths and a few 90 degree angles here and there, but the handles really felt like the spot where we could either make or break the design. So we wanted to try something that we hadn't really seen before. After a few drawings and discussions, this is what we settled on. And it felt like a good compromise where we were only introducing a few small pops of color, but letting them make a big visual impact. In addition to that, something that always interests me is coming up with new ways that I can use my X-Carve on larger pieces, or as part of a larger piece. I feel like whenever people think of the X-Carve or CNC's in general, they tend to think about a piece that is constructed entirely of parts that come off of it, or signs and so forth and that's fine. But for the type of work that I do, furniture obviously, I want to use it as more just another tool, but one that lets me quickly do things that would be hard or slow to do manually. So in this shot I'm making a drawing at the exact scale that I wanted our handles to be, and then I'm going to use that to cut a template on the X-Carve out of some 3 quarter inch MDF. Now the doors were actually small enough that I could have cut them directly on the X-Carve by sliding them onto the bed and letting the machine do all the work. But because there are slight deviations in the size of the gaps between each of the sets of doors, Nice job, Sean. I was worried that we would end up messing ourselves up somewhere. Basically, the machine's gonna cut perfect every time, but if we mess up in where we place something, it's not gonna adjust for our error. So my solution was to cut the template out where the perimeter had a 30 and a 60 degree corner cut into it. That way I could put the square on the door and use the cut edge to reference the placement which would make the handle sit on the cabinet at exactly 30 degrees every time. And by drawing directly onto the doors while the doors are still attached to the cabinet makes it so that it doesn't matter where the center gap is. The recess is going to cross the gap and stay visually aligned. Next while I continued to draw the shape of the cutout into all the doors, Sean got a drill and a Forstner bit and started removing material. And this will probably get rid of about 75% of what needs to be removed, that way the router isn't doing all the work, and things just move along more quickly and with less dust. From there we could clamp the template back onto each door, making sure to match it to the line that I'd drawn, and use a templating bit to remove the rest of the material. And this could technically be a one-man job, but we found a way to make it too. Finally, so that the pools would actually function, we got a slot cutting bit and cut a I guess, slot, into the bottom of each of the recesses. And this gives your fingers just enough purchase to make the whole thing work. The next bit to work on was the open angled shelving, which is kind of the first thing that you'll see on this piece as you walk in the room. So I started off by measuring the opening to figure out the spacing to end up with three equal cubbies. 
Once that was determined, I used some scrap plywood to cut a pair of spacers that would position the shelf just right. With those in place, I set the oversized shelf in and marked exactly where I'd need to cut the angle so that it would end up flush on each edge. Then back over at the ACS, I placed the track on the line and made the cut. With that done, I could glue it in place, and you'll notice now that it's actually halfway up the vertical distance, and that's because we decided that the three cubbies just felt a little bit too small. Also, you'll notice that the glue's doing all the work here, and you can certainly wait for it to set up a bit and then drive in some screws from the backside, but instead I cut these angular runners to laminate to the underside to help support the shelf. And I forgot to film myself installing them, but it looked kind of like this. Okay, now here's the part where I look like a hypocrite. So for all of my talk in the beginning about order of operations and yada yada yada, we forgot to drill in our shelf pinholes before gluing our cabinet together. Thankfully, they were pretty big and open, and drilling them in at this point was only slightly more inconvenient than it would have been to do them before the glue up, so I guess we just kinda got lucky there. And while we're covering more of the minutia of what functionally went inside of the cabinets, prior to mounting the doors for the tall cabinets, which we didn't get any footage of, Nice job, Sean. I installed this fixed shelf with a few pocket screws. And to help hold it in place while I installed, I had cut four pieces of scrap to the same length so that the shelf could rest evenly. And the reason that we did this before mounting the doors is because there's a good chance that installing something like this is gonna slightly change the geometry of the cabinet. Next I painted the inside of the door pool recesses a few bright pops of color, and then we could move on to sanding and finishing everything. And there was a lot of that to do, so I'm going to work on sanding everything while Sean starts the finishing process. At this point, we were finally ready for finishing, which we imagined would be a daunting task, and we were definitely right. We decided to spray on a water-based polyurethane, which I prefer to use for plywood projects like this with an exposed edge, and we probably spent a good day and a half spraying and sanding, and ended up at about three to four coats on everything. This was also a great opportunity to work on spray finishing, which is a technique that I have used plenty of times before, but certainly don't consider myself to be an expert, and Chris has a pretty limited experience with. So even with one bonehead getting quasi-instruction from another bonehead, we were able to get a nice looking finish with relative ease, which is really one of the nice parts about working together. Two heads are always better than one, even if they are just made of bone. Finally, the last thing to do was get it all in the room and install everything. And like I said, I was really happy and impressed with the way this whole thing came together, which is rare for me. And maybe that's because I went into this build feeling like it wasn't very inspired, which is kind of the opposite of normal. Normally I go into a project really liking the idea and the design, and then I view the actual build as me trying my best to preserve the idea and not ruin it in my execution. Here though, since I was only lukewarm on the aesthetic of the initial idea, maybe it freed me up to be pleasantly surprised by the outcome. But hey, you know what they say. If you have an idea for your parents' guest room and you don't think you like it, take some inspiration from your parents' restroom and then you might like it. Chris, that's not how it works. How what works? The rhyme thing for the end of the video. What do you mean like it and like it are a perfect rhyme? They're the same word. You can't rhyme a word with itself. Well, but what about parents' restroom and parents' guest room? That was pretty good, right? Yeah, I guess, but that's not the part that's supposed to rhyme. But restroom and guest room aren't the same word. Where do you take a dump? Dude, that's not the rhyme. You know what? I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. And let it be? Hey, that rhymes. Sean?